Yeah, you can hear me all right? Okay. Well, my name is Acacia Sherman Lewis. I am from Dallas, Texas. I was born in Bloomington, Indiana. This is my first breaking convention, and I just want to say thank you to the organizers, Darren and Okwea, and also Baba Mudu for inviting me to be a part of this uh, symposium, this massive event that we're having here today. This is a great honor to be here. I've been waiting several years to see all of your faces. I see a lot of people who I know in the audience, and so I want to thank you all for coming out and making time to visit. Um, the first thing I want to say is, wow. I am just in awe, and I would not be here if it weren't for the great Ahati Kalindi E, who inspired me to continuously go in deeper on higher doses, and also for my mother for naming me after a psychedelic. The number one question I've gotten asked this whole time is, did you name yourself that? If so, that's so clever, wow. <laughs> and how is it pronounced? It's Akasha, oh my goodness. You know, and, and then for me, it's like, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I hated my name because it was misspelled. And so in the dictionary, I tried to find my name. I couldn't find it anywhere. I just find the one with the I in it. Like there's no I in my name, there's the E in it, obviously. And so people would ask me how to pronounce it. And so I put this nice little uh, pronunciation key right there. It's Acacia with a hard A, Acacia, Sherman Lewis. And so my first experience with psychedelics, not surprisingly enough, uh, was Googling it on the World Wide Web when they still had AOL CD discs and we were using the big computers and, and the computer lounge and the library and finding out that Acacia was associated with something called dimethyltryptamine, DMT. So I wanna give proper respect and honor to the great Ahati Kalindi E. He said, though mushrooms may be medicine, the primary utilization of hallucinogenic mushrooms is for the exploration of consciousness. And that is the kind of exploration I put into my own research. That is how I conduct myself as an explorer. I don't conduct myself as a researcher. I came from astrophysics. I took skeptic classes. Anyone heard of, of, of pseudoscience class in college? Well, I, I loved Randall D. Scalise. He was my pseudoscience professor. He taught me that everything that I would eventually come to experience on my own through exploration was absolute malarkey and that I shouldn't be fooled by crystals and chakras and diagrams, you know, that were absolutely filled with scientific farces that could be easily uh, uh, explained as, you know, non-existent. And I'm actually with him to an extent. But there is a practice. There is a lifestyle that comes from actually uh, exploring, not for the purpose of what I can find to talk about with others. Exploring for the purpose of self-discovery and self-actualization, which is what I do. I don't do mushrooms so I can say I've done high doses. I've done past 30 dried grams and well over 200 wet grams dozens of times throughout the last 11 years of my life. And for me, it's not about what it is that science can teach us about the entheogenic experience. It's what the entheogenic experience can teach us about science. So I, I fudged a little bit. I said Ahati Kalindi E first. I actually came across Mama Kai Wingo in 2015. She is the one I was actually looking forward to meeting the most because she was a black woman doing psychedelics and high doses and I could relate to her because she looked like me and, and I was interested in actually, you know, finding out about being a mycologist. I wanted to be a mycologist back in 2014, 2013 when the first Women in Entheogens conference was about to be created. That's what I wanted to do because of Mama Kai Wingo. And she came and she spoke here once and her videos are on YouTube. She came and spoke at Breaking Convention and so she, she was a school teacher, I believe, and then she started a mushroom farm called the Buckeye Mushroom Farm in Ohio. And I took this from her obituary. Uh, she was an enthusiastic voice for the potential of mushrooms to contribute to a healthier, more sustainable world, and primarily for women to be able to release themselves from colonial trauma, from psychological trauma, and bond with each other. The first conference that was solely dedicated to mothers who are working with psychedelics was initiated by Kai Wingo. And so for that, I wanna give her honor. <laughs> uh, 
And this person right here is, I should say, I should have said her name first. This is Mike Lewis, Malati Lewis. This was my teacher. This is my guru right here. There's another guru right here, secondary. But this was my partner. We got married when I was 19 years old against my parents' wishes. And shortly after, got into a car accident on an Indian reservation with a deer. And that's the reason why I'm not a, uh, an a, a officer, a captain in the United States Air Force right now. It's because I was discharged shortly after that. And she was a Zen Buddhist who loved psychedelics. And I mean loved psychedelics. In fact, the man who's a writer of the book Secret Drugs of Buddhism, who wrote a book in 2015, and as soon as the book came out, we were both all over it. She was enamored by the book. She said, okay, all right, I, I think I get it now. Because I was actually studying Hinduism at the time in 2015. And I was actually a Hare Krishna devotee in an ashram in Arizona. And she wanted nothing to do with the Hare Krishna stuff. She couldn't stand it. You know, she, so I, I started looking up sutras for her. She was more interested in reading Amitabha's sutras and the Pure Land sutras. And so we bonded spiritually. She wanted to be uh, studying Buddhism. And I was like, nope, nope, I'm good. I'm, I'm studying Kemeticism and Hinduism. You do the Buddhism. Leave that over there. Of course, after she passed away, I became more interested and did my own research and practices and learning Buddhism. And I found out that I actually qualify. I actually, I, I think I, I would like to become a Buddhist. So I initiated last year under Lama Mike Crowley. Uh, and so now I'm an Upasika in Buddhism because of my wife and love who inspired me to teach. I would not be standing here in front of you all if she hadn't actually told me to actually put in the prompt that Mudu asked me for in 2018 at the uh, Oaxaca Food of the Gods event where Kalendi so bravely introduced us to the Food of the Gods, Psilocybin Zapotecorum, in the cloud forest of the Nahual uh, throne. So, without further ado, let's talk a little bit about how I got into psychedelics. This is the acacia tree, acacia nilotica, from the walls of ancient Kemet. And right here, you see the pharaoh giving offerings to the woman who is inside the acacia tree. And for me, my study started when I was, as soon as I could get some sort of access to the internet, I would go to the library with my father. I would sit in the computer lounge searching my name over and over and over again because I wanted to know more. And there wasn't that much information available out there. There were these pictures, like one picture or two pictures, but I didn't really understand like what was the significance until the last like probably six years of my life. There was a parasitic vine on the acacia that was always found. So the shaman, the acacia tree with its semi-parasitic vine symbolizes the path of fire spirit that rises from the base of the spine to the apex of the skull. This is a really important aspect of this because alchemists in the Middle Ages who derived their science primarily from the Arabs spoke about the fire necessary in all alchemical operations. And they spoke about a living silver, a spiritual water symbolized by the serpent of quicksilver. And so the first thing that Baba Kalindi told me when he talked about acacia, and that's partially why I was interested in his work, because he could pronounce my name right. He said acacia, not acacia. <laughs> he said acacia is an alchemy. You had to invent a pot first before you could make you know, acacia and Syrian rue. You couldn't just drink acacia. I personally, I, I like to drink acacia by itself, and I, I get a whole host of benefits. Because unlike the majority of the world that you hear talking about psychedelic plants, I'm not interested in the drugs in them solely. I'm interested in the traditional, ritual, and contextual use of plants as not only a medicine, but as a technology of exploration. Acacia nilotica has over 700 uses spread out across five different countries. And there are hundreds of species, subspecies of acacia that are used as medicinal plants for anything from leprosy, skin disease, STDs, um, postpartum depression, um, menstrual illness uh, issues. Um, there are so many different uses for acacia nilotica as babul, the spice that is utilized and traded uh, all across Africa and found in very many places across the world as just a tonic that we have to remember what the context is. Nobody knows the context. Who, what is a sunu? Who has heard of the word sunu? Everyone heard of Dr. Sunu Valentine? Dr. Phil Valentine? Yeah. Dr. Sun Sunu is the word of an Egyptian doctor. And so when we look at context, a lot of folks are looking at things from a research perspective. I'm looking at it from an initiate's perspective. I am not 
doing this research because I want to go to a university and show you a paper. I'm doing this research because this is what I am. This is, uh, this is what I was named. I was named Acacia. And I took it upon myself to study the Acacia uh, Library, the actual libraries of study that are the medicinal records of how these plants were utilized in ancient northern Africa, in uh, the area uh, that we call the land of Punt. And so that's where my grandfather's heritage on my father's side, he has some, some heritage ancestrally in that area. And so for me, this is a part of my own culture. This is not something that I'm doing just for purely spiritual reasons. I'm doing this because I want to know more about myself. And that's why I've worked with the mushroom as well, is because it belongs to my culture. My grandfather on my mother's side is from Cuba. My grandmother on my father's side is from the jungles of Panama. For me, this is a multicultural exploration and sacred plants that have a technological use. So the first thing I found when I dug deeper into acacia was the spiritual mystery. A Sunu doctor in ancient Egypt, you can look this up on, on YouTube. There's a nice little discovery channel type blip on what Sunus of ancient Egypt did. First, in order to cure someone, they became the deity or the spiritual power that was the god of the disease that the sick person had. Say they were built by, bit by a snake. They, they become the goddess of poisonous snakes and poisonous scorpions. They would extract the serpent venom out of the person with a knife. They'd lance it, and then they would say a, a prayer over the person that was specific to the deity that had knowledge about the specific sickness, in this case, a bite by a snake. So if you're a Sunu in ancient Kemet, you might have five spices total. So there's a level of scholarship that goes into knowing those spices better than anybody else. So if you've got cumin, you know how to use cumin a thousand and one different ways. If you've got garlic, you know how to use that 4,000 different ways. If you've got acacia, you know how to use it several thousand different ways. That's what a real Sunu is. And there's a train analogy. The train analogy for me is in science and in psychedelics, we are racing with speed and we are not slowing down. If we are in a train and you're looking at a mountain, you tell me that I know what the mountain is going several, uh, several miles an hour in a train, I say you're lying. You haven't gotten off the train. You haven't walked to the mountain. You don't know that there are people on that mountain and you haven't talked to the people either. And by the way, since you haven't talked to the people, then why are you telling me that there's a possibility that people could exist when you could simply get off the train and dedicate the time to go and travel to the mountain and experience the people? Your Google searches tell you nothing about herbalism. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Because there needs to be a deeper level of understanding about what these sacred plants were used for besides the fact that they contain drugs. And the fact that people don't understand the cultural an anthropological meaning of a sacred plant. A sacred plant does not mean a plant that you just smoke to get high so that you can go and see some entities who will tell you some interesting things. You can do that with acacia. But you know what she can also do? She can also condemn you to what we call the circus. And you'll be sitting there with little one-eyed deities and entities with little teeth, which can also be considered uh, potentially visions of the Buddhist mother. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, you, you might just be seeing little digital deities popping up side to side, or you might transform into a magical seraphim and be completely dissolved of your ego and trans, uh, transmitted into what we call the back rooms or the Akashic records uh, of all space and time where you are in between the cells that make up the fabric of your own skin and you cannot explain it to someone else how you are imbuing every single cell and every single molecule in your being with divine harmony and light. There's a woman in the audience named Melissa uh, Shemina, and she made this painting that she gifted to me, and it clearly shows that in visionary art, we can capture these concepts. But science cannot capture the concepts of what it looks like a woman holding a pomegranate, which symbolizes uterine health. And in the ancient world, if a woman found a pomegranate, it was a very lucky thing, because then she could heal her womb. She would become very fertile, very moist, she would, she would also be able to uh, clear her skin complexion. Her hair would grow longer. She would become the vision of beauty because of this pomegranate that was used as medicine traditionally. And so it was imbued in the ancient legends of Persephone and Hades. Persephone had 
a pomegranate tree when she visited the underworld. And the underworld, access to the underworld was given by Demeter, who had the mushroom. So this is all a part of the tradition of indigenous people. And when you practice as an indigenous person, it is different than when you practice as a scientist trying to quantify the reasons why people did what they did based on a very limited perspective of the alkaloids present in the plants they were using. That is not good enough. So when I do my research, Ayaaset is associated with the acacia tree. These are personifications of Isis. In Aztec mythology, we have Teot or Ome Teot. In Egyptian mythology, we have the Necheru, but they are all personifications of energy and motion. They are all hyper intelligent forms that exist that you can embody. They weren't meant to be worshiped, like here, have your bread, Bastet. No, you took the mushroom and you self-actualized as Ayaa said. And so the female mysteries is what I study through experience. I don't sit here and say, okay, that's a really pretty tree. That's really nice. No, what I'm looking for are breadcrumbs that were left behind for people who can read what the hieroglyphs meant, not by looking at them and translating them, but by experiencing the hieroglyphs as the living movie that they create when you are under the influence of a psychedelic and you step into the experience of the hieroglyphics. Looking at these characters on the wall, they three-dimensionalize and four-dimensionalize until you end up in a place that is where they came from. These are like a QR code, if you will. Archaeologists who are Aztec scientists, uh, you know, who are studying in Mexico City and also at the University of Maryland, James Maffey, have have actually shared that all of the characters on the codex, the Mixtec Mayan Yoda Tono codex, are actually living beings that were imbued onto deer skin and stuccoed on, and I have a picture of it for you, that these beings were time persons or persons beyond this dimension that could communicate through the altar that was the deer skin that they were painted onto. You were seeing a two-dimensional version of a five-dimensional being, a being that existed outside of time and space that was there to guide and share information like an ancestor or a deity. So when you looked at the journey of the deified heart, which is Quetzalcoatl, the initiate takes the mushroom and then he meets the sage. And if you're looking at the page on mushroom, the sage comes out of the page and starts talking to you. And then you go through the initiation real time by utilizing the information that was encoded inside of the sacred pages of the book. The same thing happens when you look at the hieroglyphs in Egypt under the influence of Acacia nilotica and Syrian rue. And under the influence of mushrooms is that you are taken into the experience firsthand. So it says, there was the belief that all goddesses and gods were born beneath the acacia tree. And the book of coming forth by day, the deceased gods uh, goes to the acacia tree of the children, referring to the divine children of Ayaaset, uh, the goddesses and gods both born beneath the sacred acacia. Now this is a female mystery right here. The acacia tree is also in the same shape as the placenta. Has anyone ever seen a placenta? If you haven't seen a placenta, it looks just like the tree of life. It's an umbrella tree. Women who were giving birth would oftentimes take a soup of acacia bark or babool bark because it would stop bleeding. So if you're having a baby and you're already emitting blood, then that means that you would take the acacia and then once you are ready to give birth to the child, this is uh, the goddess uh, Newt giving birth to the sun. Goddess Newt is the sky and the sun is raw. So when, when this was born, when this child was born, he was swimming in his own amniotic fluid or the red. And these stories were saved, they were inscribed. For this reason it is said that Isis, when she was aware of being pregnant, put on a protective amulet, which is an amulet of Bess. And Bess is the god of Syrian rue. So it's encoded in the actual myth what the alchemical formula was to create act, orally active DMT with acacia and Syrian rue. And it said to return to the myth of Bubastis, a not fully formed baboon, is the image of a pu premature fetus. So this handbook basically shows you the book of Newt, which is the book of birth, basically. And then the book Myths of the Delta, the birth of the sun and the moon, rather the associated gods, are described in biological terms. So these myths were encoded as stories so they could be passed on and shared, but they weren't actually myths. They were manuals. And so... When we look at this story, for instance, 
uh, when Isis was aware of being pregnant, she put on the protective amulet. And so when we look at the god Bess, he's carrying with him an amulet of Bastet. So when you take the psych psychedelic mushroom and you look at the image of Bastet, then you have an opportunity to actualize or meditate on her statue and become the sacred form of Ayaa set in the form of of Isis in the form of Bastet. So this is the divine masculine and divine feminine. One's Osiris, one's Isis. These were codes, if you will, and person personalities of the same force. Bess was the god of drunkenness and also the protector of mothers and children and childbirthing women. So when you were in childbirth and you got the little dwarven statue, here's the quote right here. I am Horus. Uh, Isis is suffering from her back part being pregnant, but her, her months have been completed and number of pregnancy. It said, in a further spell, the situation of the husband and father to be is explained lifelike, saying, I am Horus. I had come down from the desert being thirsty on shouting, and I found someone who stood weeping. His wife was nearing her time, meaning she was about to give birth. The woman had shouted to the man for a dwarf statue of clay, that she may be caused to give birth uh, the one who was coming. And this spell is talking about the fact that Syrian Ru induces child birth. It's, birth. it's an abortificant. So if the child wasn't coming out fast enough, and you'd already taken the acacia to loosen the placenta, the placenta had already separated from its walls, and the Syrian woman caused the child to, to come out of the womb. It, would, it, it was a part of the divine birth. So when you see the mythological story of Newt and Geb and, and Ra being birthed through Newt's womb, that's the sun coming up in the morning, but it also symbolizes the birth of a child. And to the ancient Egyptians who are working with the psychedelics, these stories captured very real moments in their everyday daily life. And they were quantum. The sun rising was like a, a child being born. It's a new day, it's a new opportunity, and reverence was given to that day. That's why reverence was given also to the sun god and also synonymous with a child being born or a divine child. So that's the fractal geometry of the acacia tree and also of the placenta and also the structure of the mushroom. And so I talk about the mushroom as a human experience. I know I'm running out of time a little bit. The key here is what is sight? When we work with the mushroom, I'm talking about looking at statues and being able to absorb information from them. You look at a statue and you might become inspired right now, but if you take 20 grams and you look at a statue of Bastet long enough, you may feel or see something come out of that statue, or you may actualize that being and receive instructions from it, which is what I've experienced directly. When I miscarried my first child, I had an experience of becoming Sekhmet. And that experience changed me forever because for me, what it meant was I was going through a process of evolving womanhood. I looked in the mirror and I saw that I had cat's teeth and I could feel that I had a holographic tail. And I walked through my house and I looked at the trappings, I looked at the curtains, and I realized I was in the underworld, but that my house wasn't very clean because I could see all the residual energy from my stress and from my anger and anxiety with the person who I had been at that time affecting my whole house. So I upgraded the energy of my whole home consciously. And that was part of the female mysteries, but you can't do that if you can't see. So extra dimensions and parallel universes are unproven aspects of physics, but we talk about them all the time. This is the woo they talk about. Oh, you psychedelic people are talking about that quantum woo. Well, guess what? Having an enhanced emission of sight may assist in the process of modulating your neurotransmitters. So in Shipibo language, this is a plant that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, piri piri is a plant that comes from the papyrus or river reed. This was a plant that was used oftentimes in ancient Egypt. Uh, the last name of this, this wonderful person is Shamana. And Shamana is a term for mukkuts as well. Mukkuts is a monatomic bread that comes from the roots of the papyrus plant. In Peru, the same papyrus plant, the Nile River papyrus, is also growing on the Amazon River Basin. And the Shipibo people have been using it for their infants. Ever since a baby was born in their tribe, they would drip little drops made of piri piri into the child's eyes in order to awaken and cause kanastawa, or sight to the ability to see things on his journey to the other world or in the psychedelic experience from birth. You go to these shamans looking for them to help you out and stuff, and you don't realize that ever since they were born, they were automatically given an extra dimension of sight because there's ergo growing in the roots of the tiger nut. I've ordered tiger nut from Spain, 
And it's been quite a trippy experience. I actually recreated these recipes for myself and made myself mushroom infused tiger nut honey cone rolls. And so for me, I've, I've also worked with Piri Piri from the Shipibo tribes of Peru. And I can tell you this, it's like microdosing LSD, but better. It's like microdosing LSD, but directly in your eyes so that you start seeing the different patterns and vibrational energy that's all around you all the time. So this site, this is a, a picture from Avatar. In Shipibo's world, it means focusing better. The Piri Piri drops are used to improve the ability to focus in crafts like sewing, painting, embroidery, and artisan ceramics. If you look at the uh, border of this, this is actually a, a kene cloth. And kene is also related to kente cloth. These words that we use to describe these patterns are all related to each other because they come from the experience of being able to see visions on the other side or in another dimensional realm. So this is the papyrus grass. There's papyrus, that ergo fungus grows on the tiger nuts that are the rhizome of the papyrus and absorb a large amount of micronutrients. So the Nile River Delta contains a ton of monatomic sediment, gold, rhodium, iridium, silver. When you eat tiger nut, you're also getting a little bit of monatomic gold, which also helps your body to be able to process information, and a lot of monatomic zinc. That zinc is what helps your neurons to communicate with each other better. So people who are eating tiger nut and also combining it uh, with honey uh, and say acacia and Syrian rue or the mushroom, it could enhance their psychedelic journeys. And then there's the actual canary grass of the cows of ancient Kemet that were considered sacred. The Hathor cow is also a women's system, a mystery school for how women can take care of their household. But even so, a visage of the cow that eats the grass that contains DMT and produces the mushroom, the Tamarian blue mushroom, which contains even more DMT. So here's some muff cuts right here. The story behind the bread of the gods. Uh, it says that before the king were the two offering stands topped with lotus flowers. Behind them, there's a man bearing a conical object as the white bread. And so these conical bread cakes were given to the king as a dessert. This was Breckmeyer's favorite dessert, muff cuts bread. And this is something that was made out of tiger nut. And the tiger nut is still around to this day. So here's Sekhmet. And the story of Sekhmet, the reason why this picture that I put up was so important to me is because it says that Sekhmet, after she gave her rampage and destroyed humanity, that at the site of the carnage, Ra repented in his actions and ordered Sekhmet to stop killing. Sekhmet did not listen, so he tricked Sekhmet into drinking beer with pomegranate juice instead of blood. Beer at that time was made from Syrian rue. They didn't have crushed wine. They didn't have Pinot. This was made of Syrian rue because the god of drunkenness was also the god of Syrian rue. So at that time, Sekhmet was drinking Syrian rue and pomegranate juice. And it's also a metaphor for a woman on her period. It's saying that Sekhmet went on a rampage and the rivers ran with blood. This is a metaphor. All right? We're taking things too literally in mythology when, when there's an indigenous perspective here that's not even being opened up or awakened to. If you look at this and say, this is a legend, your kids would say, oh, well, I know what that means. When the rivers run with blood, we give her, we give her beer and pomegranate juice. That's going to calm her down. And guess what? Syrian root helps to stop bleeding. So if she's menstruating too much and rivers are flowing with blood, then the, the Syrian root is going to stop her womb from bleeding too much. And the pomegranate is going to increase the density of her uterine wall so she doesn't hemorrhage out. It could literally save her life. And that's why the story of Sekhmet is not a story of a goddess who literally killed all of humanity. It's a story of a woman who was bleeding profusely and used sacred medicine in order to heal herself. So this is Ziwang Mu, this is Sima Muka. These are other uh, forms of lion-faced women that are also related to female spiritual mystery systems. This is the god Bess of Syrian Ru. I was going to say, this is the first plant ever synthesized in the cancer medita uh, medis medication, Eyebright, which also helps to open uh, your eyes to different patterns in your reality. It gives you really clear sight. This is African periwinkle. It also happens to be the first cancer uh, medication ever offered to the public. And canna. So this is the last thing I'll say. Uh, canna, for me, saved my life because I was addicted to tobacco, and it's the oldest natural antidepressant on the continent of Africa. Canna is oftentimes overlooked because of daga and other herbs that the Khoisan used. But canna is a secret herb. The reason why is in 1662, the Dutch colonial administrator exchange sheep for canna, and he said it's like ginseng. So the Dutch started trading canna 
in the 1600s and then decided that they were going to call it a sought after form of ginseng. Colonial settlements brought about the movement of plants, introduced new varieties and dispossessed the sand. They stole their land and they killed them off over this one plant. And you guys, I really want you to, to capture that the history of the trance dance is embedded in the canna. They weren't smoking cannabis yet 3,000 years ago. The, the Bantu introduced them to cannabis. They were smoking canna, and guess what? It, it put them in a trance state so deep that they felt like they were walking on the stars, and they could see where they were walking, and when they would fly up into those other dimensions of space and time, they would bring back songs and dances so that their entire society could run peacefully. This is the world's oldest known antidepressant that was used in an herbal form as an SSRI. And it's not addictive, meaning the less you take, the more effective it is. It has a PDE4 inhibitor that can also treat schizophrenia and bipolarism. So this was mental health. You can buy this for $6.50 on Etsy.com right now because the, the pharmaceutical industry has tried synthesizing it to a hundred time extract, which is actually toxic. Because it's more powerful at lower dose, that means you don't have to take it in extract form. So people who are getting high and using it like crack, a hundred time and a thousand time doses have never actually had an authentic canna experience because you're supposed to chew it and spit it out or smoke it and then move around. And so because the traditional use was overlooked completely, canna actually has a crappy uh, reputation in areas where children are using it at a hundred times its dose as a legal high. It's not, to, it's not for you to just get high, it's for you to sort out your addictions. This is in Fefo. It contains GABA. This is a South, uh, a South African incense that's wrapped up and just like a white sage bundle. You have a white sage bundle and you burn it like a torch. Well, this torch contains GABA. So everyone in the room is going to relax. As soon as you burn the infefo, everybody who's having a bad trip, it's going to lay down and relax because GABA is what helps your body to physically feel calm. And that's also when you're addicted to substances, the first thing that starts to go when your brain uh, is stressed out, it's your GABA receptors. You actually start deleting them. So this is, you know, just information uh, about multidisciplinary research. Personally, I feel like myth, legend, and ritual context should be included in the tradition of honoring the indigenous knowledge behind original use. Because if we don't honor the actual tradition and the poetry and the ritual stories, as stories and as instructions, then we won't ever really fully see a full picture of indigenous plant medicine use. Thank you.